Hello everyone, I'm Captain Foley. And as always, I mean always, I'm Connor Coggins. And we welcome you back to your home away from home, the Trek Yards universe. Come on, admit it. Some of you have Trek Yardians stamped on your passports as your primary citizenship. <laughs> but seriously, we have a bit with us a very special guest for you today, uh, Mr. John Ease, everyone. Welcome back to the show, John. Howdy, howdy. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Today we are, we'll be looking at a great ship and learning about its design origins and de design philosophy from the man that created her. I'm of course referring to the very popular Enterprise E, or the Sovereign class as first seen in the feature film, Star Trek First Contact. So let's suit up and make it so. Yeah, so like you said, the first time we saw it was in First Contact, you know, during that epic battle sequence of Sector 001. Uh, in Generations, you know, we saw the demise of the Great Galaxy class, or the Enterprise D, which many people had called home for so many years while watching TNG. So can you tell us, you know, what point you knew you were going to be designing this next ship, you know, the next ship to, you know, have the name Enterprise, and, you know, what made you, you know, what, what were you feeling when you knew that you'd be bringing another ship to this legacy? Um, it was it was an interesting thing, because I've worked in the model shop uh, ages before I started in the art department, and when we built the Enterprise D, it was uh, designed for TV format, that's why it's shorter. And the same thing with uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica. They made the stars much brighter because they felt it wouldn't show, you know. So uh, when we went to the motion picture of Generations, uh, they had to do a lot of work to make that D fit the widescreen view. And uh, making the model, it was it, it seemed that it was kind of um, had great views from the front and the back and, front, and when it would arch through. But from the side, it, it kind of had a, a kind of a, a, a balance issue. Um, and uh, it always looked kind of front heavy, so it, uh, that's why they'd always have it kind of flying over the camera and stuff. And I always thought, boy, if I ever had a chance to do an Enterprise, what would I do with it? And I always loved the Matt Jeffries one. And uh, after generations, I went back to the model shop, and then Herman Zimmerman called to come back to Deep Space Nine. They had an opening, Jim Martin had moved on. And so uh, I got in there, I think I did maybe four episodes of Deep Space Nine, and then Herman goes, we're going to do First Contact, and we're going to need a new Enterprise, so if you want to start sketching... And he walked away, and that was basically it. It's like, sure, I'll do it. And then, uh, then it hit like the gravity of, of what that was. And uh, I don't know. I was in shock for quite a while. I think, oh boy, because the Enterprise B was a great fun thing to do, and never thought I'd get the opportunity to make another one. And um, so that's kind of how it started. And uh, just that little brief ten-second conversation at my desk. So one of the first things I think about when I hear this ship mentioned is this six-foot studio model that was built. It must have been a very impressive sight. But soon after it was built, the CGI model was constructed to replace it. Uh, so can you please tell us a little about the process that was involved going from initial concept to physical model and then to CGI and why those decisions were made? And also, for the audience, just let us know which shots maybe use the physical model so that we can go back and see how much better it is than CG. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, what uh, uh, happened, this is actually, the, the Enterprise E is the last actual physical miniature built for uh, Star Trek. It was right on the edge of the of the CG world. And uh, I knew all the guys up at ILM from uh, other shows. And I knew John Goodson would be one of the model makers in charge of uh, putting that ship together. And so uh, doing a lot of the artwork, it took quite a few sketches to get uh, an approved idea. And uh, I was kind of leaning more towards the D with the shorter nacelles. And uh, I, uh, I rotated the saucer to give it a more aggressive kind of feel. And the whole idea behind the E is that it was a battleship. It wasn't a, a science exploration ship. And I think that caused a lot of issue because that was something that was in-house news. Yet uh, to the general public when they saw the movie, it's like, hey, this is a completely different kind of concept for what an enterprise is going to be. And uh, after time and the Internet, you know, all that kind of paved the way. But um, doing the original sketches, uh, would send them up to ILM and Bill George and John Goodson would go over them. John Knoll was a part of that team. And uh, they kind of decided what size this model was going to have to be. And so they figured out about 11, 12 feet that because of all the, the scrutiny of the close shots and stuff. And the bigger model, the closer you can get. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we got to the point where we had to make a study model just to help out with some angles because the artwork can only goes so far and having a physical model you can turn around you can hire a lot of problems so um i actually have one in the garage i'll, I'll bring it in and show you the study model we we built for it and um that study model actually wound up being the gold plated model in the in the uh, observation lounge so it lived a double purpose and we actually had it on the set as well but but that whole process was kind of going back and forth with ilm and making sure the size would work out in that type of scenario so together we kind of collaborated on the whole process 
Ken, what time, at what point was the decision made to go to CG? And was that just uh, for cost or for, was that for detail? Uh, CG was an issue because uh, uh, when they had built the model, they, uh, they had uh, tried a whole bunch of new processes on it, model making wise. They cast it out of clear material uh, originally. And uh, they were going to do this little um, kind of excerpt where they were going to, uh, instead of just having frosted windows, they were actually going to put slides. They took slides of the Enterprise D of all the sets and uh, put them on uh -huh. a back of microscope slide actually behind the window. So it would have it a little bit of a 3D when the camera would go by. So you'd look like there's a real set in there. They wanted to get that tight on the ship. And uh, for some reason, that clear material was always tacky. So every time they pull out of the mold, it was sticky. And they couldn't really get around that issue. And uh, it was killing a lot of their time while they were trying to make this model. So at the same time, they're going, we might have to do a CG model to make up the differences. And so in the long run, they wound up making a, a traditional model out of the normal material, cutting each window out, putting the slides in. And uh, then they had an issue with the paint. The paint wasn't coming out as, like the way they wanted it. So when they'd peel the, uh, they'd uh, layer it with uh, kind of tape and stickers and stuff, spray a coat and then peel that out and it would give you the multiple levels. And it wasn't holding up to the scrutiny that they wanted. So uh, a lot of the distant shots are these, like in the nebula, that's the, mini the physical miniature. When you're on the tight stuff, you're getting into the CG world. So they kind of crisscross in that battle uh, with the Borg cube and the Borg sphere. That's kind of a mixture of both uh, CG and the physical miniature. So it goes that way throughout the entire movie. But the very first scene we see with it in the nebula is the physical model. So the first time we see the ship is the physical model. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. You have a couple of shots where you're panning across the, the, the back of it. When it's doing the orbit around the Earth, that's the physical miniature. And, uh, oh, cool. So it really was just bad luck then that the E didn't continue being a, a, a physical. Do you think if it had gone ultra smooth and, and you know everything had gone out of the hitch, do you think they would have actually used the physical for all three movies and stuck with that? Or do you think the moved CG was inevitable? Oh, yeah, it certainly was, because it was the same with the TV shows. To make a miniature for, like, say, Deep Space Nine, it was a big deal because you had to have a miniature drawn up, you had to have it built, then you had to do motion control. It was all a big, giant process. And that's why you don't see that many new ships in, in Deep Space Nine. Voyager kind of crossed the line where they started to go CG in the middle, so you'll start to see more vessels and more ships. And with Enterprise, we were averaging sometimes five new ships a show just because it was an easier process. But in the movies, um, it was just, just the, the trend to go, and a lot of the effects houses were starting to close up that had motion control. ILM still, of course, had it, but... Uh, Apogee was kind of going out, uh, Boss is gone. So all the big places that could do that kind of stuff, the only one left was Image G, and they did most of the Star Trek work to begin with. They were a smaller house. They couldn't handle a motion picture size miniature because their blue screen was kind of small, But um, so they'd have to go out. But um, just with the times, it went CG, and that's kind of the way it went. Santa Barbara FX did uh, uh, Insurrection, and uh, they had a hard time because they were mostly environments, an environment kind of, effects house, so the new planets and nebulas and all that stuff. So getting the physical models was a great big challenge for them. Yeah. I have to ask, where is the six foot model now? What happened to it? The six foot, it was actually 11 foot. Oh, 11 foot, sorry. Yeah, um, they uh, they went between six and 11 with the larger scale. And uh, uh, it sold at uh, the Christie's auction and a gentleman that had uh, restored the uh, space shuttle, the Galileo. Actually, has that in his collection. So oh, excellent! Nice. He had it completely restored and uh, pretty fantastic. So model. it's in good hands then, which is awesome. Yeah, he is a brilliant collector of this stuff. So great, great, very great, great uh, guy to have all the stuff. So you know the uh, scene in Nemesis where the, he smashes into the scimitar. How much more difficult would that have been with a physical model? Uh, the whole uh, crash sequence was miniature. They made a giant saucer and a giant scimitar front end. Okay. And uh, <laughs> they collided them together. So a lot of a lot of. Uh, Brass work and plaster and stuff. So when it would hit, and they'd film it, so gravity would work to their advantage. So the pieces would fall down instead of fall and fall. That's incredible. On way. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so this was a much sleeker looking ship than the Galaxy class, and obviously designed with a more militaristic feel. As you know, it was designed to fight the Borg after all. And um, can you tell us what instructions you would get and what directions when designing the ship? You know, what influenced you the most? Um, you know, to give it such a dramatic departure from the Galaxy class. You know, we'd seen that design for so many years, and and and. and well, at the end of it, how did you think fans would react to such a radical change? Um, just in the design process, Herman Zimmerman was uh, the designer. And so uh, we would sit and would talk about things. And uh, we'd, we'd just kind of go, what do you think, Herman, since it's a battleship, what, what do you say we lose the neck? Because uh, 
you know, in Wrath of Khan, it's a vulnerable place. A couple more hits, and that would have been separated. And uh, so I go, if we make it sleeker, it makes it a more narrow, harder target to hit. And uh, so that's why it got really kind of compacted as, as, as opposed to being a taller taller vessel as, as a, in the, the profile sense. Um, so we, we kind of went back and forth on what to do. The shorter nacelles weren't working. And about that time, um, I think it's the, uh, oh, it's one of, one of the X-planes, and it had a, a swept wing format. We thought, let's give that a try on the stretch to maybe try something different. And uh, we're doing a whole bunch of process with that, the drawings, and Rick Berman kind of liked that idea. And one of the one of the gentlemen in the art department, uh, Fritz Zim and Herman's son, looked at it and goes, hey, it looks like a turkey in a pan. And it just cursed it from the top view. So he goes, yeah, it looks like a turkey with those forward struts and the engine. So we went with a more uh, kind of aggressive uh, reverse view of that. And it, it needed it. So um, it, as much as the, the forward struts was kind of a, a new idea, it just didn't work. So. What were, the, what were some of the initial words, maybe, that, that they said to you? You know, these are the key words that must be included in the design that you first heard. Uh, it had to be, uh, like we discussed, it was going to be a battleship. Um, not really a lot of uh, dialogue on which way it was going to go. Uh, Herman usually lets people in the art department run a course, and then he starts adding notes to them. Oh, I like that, or I hate this. And so... Um, the notes would kind of come as the drawings and the sketches were going. So initially it just said New Enterprise, and uh, at one point it was going to be a D class, or the Galaxy class, and they were just going to change the, uh, the letter to an E instead of a D. And it's all, it was all about budget at that time, and uh, Star Trek did not have a big budget. They split the art department between the TV shows and the movies, so we just moved from one to the other and split the day. And so uh, the budgets were not anything like they are now. And so uh, anytime they could save money on a model was a good deal. But looking at it, they had a big decision. No, let's not go with that. Let's make a new ship. And so they put their efforts into that. But like I said, there was really no distinctive words or terms that we used to make this ship. It was just some sketches, and then the, then the notes started to follow. That's cool. uh, one, one of the most notable changes to this design evolution is the connecting dorsal, or the neck, if you will, of the ship. The E basically has no neck. Now, I personally think it's a great look, and it makes the ship feel much more battle-ready. Um, can you talk a little bit about that particular design choice, yeah. and how have fans expressed themselves to you about that? Is it very positive, or what you, what's your um, experience been with the fans? Uh, it was funny when I was doing that. I didn't know computers or the Internet at all, and so uh, Mike Akuda <laughs> sitting behind me uh, when the ship came out in the movie. He'd come out and go, boy, people are 50-50 on this. They really, really hate it. Are they, are they really, really liked it? There's kind of no in between the ground. But um, we were thinking more, more story-wise when we were doing that design. And I loved the Excelsior, one of my favorite ships, even though it wasn't an Enterprise at the time. And I loved that sweep that it had right on the front there. And I thought, you know, if I just drop, lose that neck and drop the saucer onto the body, that might, uh, there you go, two versions, might take care of uh, the issue of, of it being attacked or being a, a point of attack. So. Mm. That's why we made the struts lower, made them big and thick, and, and all that stuff is just basically to vend off any type of attack that would separate parts of the ship. Excellent. And out of the other Federation ships you'd seen, what do you think were the main influences that you actually had taken maybe little elements from? Uh, mostly Matt Jeffries. I kind of combined Matt Jeffries' aesthetics with uh, with what Bill George had done with the Excelsior there, and I just did a big merge of the two with my favorite elements. And going back to the longer nacelles was a real treat. And uh, we just gave uh, Mr. Berman a couple of views to look at. We just put a, a, a note on it and say, this balances fairly well. And he goes, yeah, I think so. And so he was he was pretty much behind all the sketches as we went. And um, his feedback would go through Herman, and Herman would give me notes. And so Herman would kind of take uh, what uh, Mr. Berman would say and kind of uh, paraphrase it to what he was thinking and, or what he thought Mr. Berman wanted. So it all worked out pretty good.